Всем привет! Я Марианна, и я буду рассказывать о ориентированном мышлении, что я вообще имею в виду, как вы можете использовать это в каждом из стадий процесса создания машинного обучения. Также я буду рассказывать некоторые типы и трюки, и кейсы, которые я имел, и могли бы использовать, если вы вообще использовали этот мышлений. So uh, the agenda of this talk can be divided into several parts. At first, I'm going to tell you uh, what deployment actually is and why you should care about that. Then I will tell you about some uh, maybe problems which you can have uh, during deployment if you actually haven't prepared for that ahead. About things you can do at each of the stages of the process of building machine learning models. And, uh, In the end, I will describe what actually this mindset gives you as a result. So why am I actually telling you this? I think I'm a bit experienced in deploying and developing models, and uh, when I led the team, I participated in, two, in the development of two different deployment services, and uh, the second one was the uh, improvement of the first one in terms of architecture. And also, yeah, the mother of three ducks, so you can see them all here. If you want to, you can come and uh, check them out. They helped me a lot with debugging some errors they had during deployment. Why am I actually telling you this? I think that me and probably most of the data scientists, uh, the things we do is we dive into the complex problems, we try to uncover some hidden patterns in data, some correlations, Maybe we want to improve some rule-based models or we try to enhance the performance of existing models. And this is what we do, this is the research. But this is not why we do that. And uh, if I ask like, any of you here in the audience why you actually do what you do, I probably will get completely different answers from all of you. You can tell me that you actually care about your product, that you want to improve it, you want to maybe gain a customer's attention to your product. Or maybe you want to solve some socially important problem and even change the world with your solution, why not? Because the research, for the sake of a research, it's meaningless. It, it has to have some meaning and impact. And the deployment in this case, it serves like a bridge between these two questions. Deployment is something that actually makes your solution real. Uh, when you deploy your model, you see the impact of it, you see how it behaves in a real system, how it actually influences your system and uh, see its business value and business meaning. And when I say deployment, uh, I usually refer to some kind of uh, model wrapper. So this is like one of the most uh, simple possible explanation of uh, deployment. So you have some kind of a service where you wrap your pre-trained model. And uh, I'm not talking about online learning here, so we just have a trained model, which is not changing until we update it manually or retrain it. So here we have some dockerized, but not necessarily dockerized service, and we get some requests from the system and we want to get a uh, model score as a result. But of course, you actually should also care about the data you feed to the model. You should think uh, about pre-processing this data and getting, getting it from the database. So um, I'm not showing it here for now, but uh, actually you have those parts in your service as well. Or you can build it uh, in a different kinds of uh, architecture and you can encapsulate the features calculation and the process of fetching the raw data. So uh, for now, it probably looks quite simple, like uh, what can possibly go wrong at this stage? But I had my shell fails too, and that's why I'm actually sharing with you my experience, because sometimes you have to learn something the hard way. And uh, so you would know how to organize uh, the process of development uh, in more efficient and a better way. So there are several deployment problems you may have if you don't prepare for it ahead, um, and I will mention some of them, obviously not all of them. So uh, the first one is model response inconsistency. So let's imagine we have uh, like two environments. The first one is a research environment. It can be Jupyter notebooks or anything else you use for that. 
So uh, in your research environment, you actually develop in your models, you do all the experiments, and uh, also we have a development environment. It's somewhere where, where you're actually writing the code for your service, for your mo model wrapper. It can be some uh, like code editor, spy charm, whatever you use for that. And when you test your model, you have to check how your model behaves in both of those environments. So you test it on the same data set. Like you have, uh, obviously you have to check it on the same data set because you want to see how your model performs in different environments. And when you have model response inconsistency, you notice that uh, you actually get different model scores for the same records. And in this case, um, like a lot of things can go wrong. Like you can have problems with versioning or you maybe have to dive on the lower levels and to see that maybe something uh, happens uh, with data, with the way how you calculate your features. So here is like the next problem, features inconsistency, which is connected to the previous one. In this case, again, you test uh, your models in both of the environments, and you see that uh, for the same feature, you get different values. But it's the same model, you just like embedded it into the service, and you try to understand why it actually happens. So uh, in this case, like anything can go wrong. You can notice that uh, for some reason, you're inputting the missing values in your development environment in a different way uh, than you, you do that in the research environment. You can notice that you have some problems with precision of your calculations. Or maybe it's something simple like you're connecting to the different databases or the versions of the libraries you use are different in both of those environments. Also, you can notice, you, you can, uh, when you are developing your model, you process your features uh, in batches usually. And uh, for instance, for the development environment, you apply it per record. You try to do these calculations per record. And for that, you can use different library versions, uh, different functions and way of writing it, and here can be the problem as well. And these are not the only problems you can have uh, during when you start deploying your model. You can also just realize that it's impossible to implement some features calculation. That, uh, for instance, you used some library A, which is compatible only with the newest version of library B, and uh, in your deployment service for some of the previous models, uh, you have like uh, all the version of library B and you just cannot upgrade it that simple. You have to make a lot of changes, you have to retrain models and it influences the way how they perform in production. So you probably have to remove some features. Or you can realize that your model is just not scalable, it's not fast enough, it cannot process the whole stream of applications in production environment. And this is all not cool, but you can solve some of those problems uh, when you try to do that at, stage, at the early stages of the development of your models. Probably your model development process looks something like that. It's a classic CRISP-DM diagram. Or maybe it looks more like that, like it's built in iterations, in more agile style, or maybe you even have a research process and you don't have to care about deployment for now at all. Lucky you. But we will stop at uh, this simple description. It doesn't really matter here whether it's just an iteration in your process or it's the whole process itself. So in any case, we have business understanding, data understanding, data preparation and modeling stages. And only at, at the evaluation stage, you realize whether you actually go in to deploy your model. And it can be quite late for making some major fixes like changing the features you use, like changing the architecture of the model you use. So uh, when you start to change all of those things only at the deployment stage, you have to like iterate back to all of the processes. And in such a way, uh, your deadlines expand infinitely. You have to like change a lot of things and it's an uh, unpleasant thing. So you can start even at the business standing uh, stage to uh, change something and prepare for the deployment. Uh, for instance, you can, uh, when you're planning what you're actually going to build, uh, you can ask yourself not only how you're going to evaluate your solution or what it's actually going to be about. You can ask yourself, do I have any limitations when I'm going to deploy it, even if I'm not sure that I'm actually going to deploy it? You can ask yourself, 
like uh, maybe my model should respond as fast as it's possible, or maybe my features should be calculated in the most possible efficient way, or maybe I should actually care about uh, the data, how I fetch it from the database. Or maybe I should start also involving some people because it's not necessarily that you are going to deploy your model. It can be data engineers, it can be developers, and you have to prepare them for that as well. So when you are embedding your model in the system, you should understand that your model is not just a pre-trained model object. It is also the features calculation, it's fetching the raw data, and from my experience, uh, both of those segments cause uh, much more troubles than anything connected with uh, just getting the prediction from pre-trained model. Here I only had some problems with versions of the libraries or models versions. But with features like you can have problems with calculations, with uh, the efficiency of them. Uh, when you fetch zero data, you can just realize that your database is stored like on some faraway servers. Uh, in some data center in another country, and it takes some limited uh, like fixed time to get the response from your database, and you cannot change it. You have to think a lot about uh, improving the efficiency of your features. So to sum up, at business understanding stage, uh, you can pay attention to model response time, to features calculation time, and to the way how fast your database responds to your requests. And also, human resources availability is important as well. You can start involving people and preparing them that you actually will need someone else's help for that. At the next data understanding stage, uh, you can think already about limiting your data sources. When I say data sources, I usually mean some not only the databases you have in your company, but uh, also your company can have a partnership with some, someone else who provides you like, the data in some files, or uh, you can parse some web pages, and in such a way uh, you already can understand for yourself whether you actually will be able to use all of those sources in a production environment, in your deployment service. So you can just end up, for instance, with such a situation that you scrapped some page for your features, which had a constraint that you can send only one request per minute. And it was okay during the development because you gathered the data set, you came up with some maybe elaborate way of doing that, um, but in production, you actually realize that uh, the stream of applications, it's much more thick. So the applications, they come more frequently than one per minute. So you have to send the requests for scrapping uh, much more frequently. And maybe in such a way, you have to remove those features. Or maybe you should, uh, I don't know, come up with some more or less elaborate way to fix that. And when you understand it only when you try to de deploy your model, it's already quite late for changing some features, and it may harm the accuracy and performance of your model if you already know that those features are quite good for performance of your model. Also, you can start working closely with your colleagues. Like building the communication with those who can influence uh, how the data is stored in your company who can make decisions about changing that is highly important, uh, and you can already do it at the data understanding stage. Because otherwise, you can end up with such a situation that some of your colleagues just comes to you and tells you, like, we had a really important business meeting, and we got the feedback from the customers, and they say that the application form is so long, they don't want to fill long application forms. So we decided like, to remove uh, one field, uh, but uh, it's like, okay, the developers, they manage that, they already deployed it to production, and uh, it's all right on this side. Is it okay for you? And you're like, ouch, it was one of the top features. And it's probably okay if you are still in the development uh, phase, when you can change some things, you can go back and uh, change something in features and retrain your model. But what if your models are already running in production? And uh, it's even okay if uh, someone actually comes to you and tells you that something has changed. But what if uh, you just monitor your models in production and you see that something has changed, that the model behaves in an incorrect way and you cannot just trace back and understand what actually happened. 
So when you try to explain to like build this data driven approach in your company and you try to explain to us is how they influence your work, how they can change what you do uh, in such a way that they will just come to you early and will tell you, like, we want to change this and that. Does it influence your work somehow? Maybe you can convince us that we shouldn't do that at all. At the next modeling stage, you can think about refactoring. I know you can probably tell me that we are not developers, we are data scientists, we want to dive into the feature selection, hyperparameters tuning, we don't want to, why, why we should work on our code and uh, all that uh, stuff. But I will tell you for sure that it, uh, it is important and I would uh, recommend to use this uh, framework so you write your feature and you don't just go to building the baseline models and do all this interesting uh, stuff like feature selection and so on. You go back to your code and you test your feature. Um, you test not only the way how it is uh, calculated, is it correct, and whether your code actually works, you also test uh, the, how it, um, is it correct in terms of the business meaning. For instance, you know that uh, your feature cannot have uh, those particular values, and you know that uh, for some, you see that for some reason in your data set, some like anomaly happened, which shouldn't be there. For instance, uh, you know that uh, in, in your, the website of your company has some application form with obligatory fields. So, like, all the customers who move to the last steps, they should have the data in those obligatory fields. And then you see that, uh, for some reasons, some records lack this data in uh, those obligatory fields. And you can just, like, impute the missing values and move on and start training your model, but that would be incorrect, because uh, probably some bug happened in recording, in recording this data, or maybe it was test applications and you just uh, didn't know that. Uh, so uh, it is incorrect to use this data for the models. So in my case, uh, I found, I found uh, like a lot of bugs uh, in the system when I paid attention to this factor that uh, some features, they just have to take particular values and they cannot just uh, uh, can have those values like missing or something like that. Also pay attention to your code readability. As I already said, it's not necessarily that you are going to be the one who deploys your model. It can be someone else from your team, and again, it can be you in several weeks and maybe months, and you won't be able to understand what actually your features meant. And uh, improve your code efficiency too. As I said, that there are some constraints which sometimes you cannot change, like the way how fast you get the response from the database. Or maybe you work on your model and you make it as lightweight as possible, but still um, you, you have this fixed time and you cannot change that. So you have to work on your features, you have to uh, like pay attention to your code because this is like a, a broad uh, area to change something about the efficiency and make it better. And you can iterate over those steps as much as you like and you can allow yourself in terms of the deadlines but uh, obviously for the re reasonable number of times. I would, if you don't know what to start from, I would recommend those books like Python Tricks, Effective Python, and Style Guide is good as well, so if you write your models in Python, you can just refer to those books and, uh, and you will know how to write more Pythonic code, how to write your code in a better style. So, uh, except for refactoring, you can uh, also already test uh, how fast your model responds. And for that, you can use, uh, for instance, uh, this plugin for Jupyter Notebooks, if you uh, are using Jupyter Notebooks for the development. So, in such a way, you just see in the cell that you're running, how, fast does, how much time does it take to run this cell. But it's not that accurate, but quite convenient if you have to just make a fast checkup. Also, you can use time module. I would recommend personally to use time model or IPython magic time. And uh, you can, in such a way, compare different versions, compare different pipelines, and if actually efficiency is a high priority for the deployment, uh, those tools will help you with that. And also, with things just to keep in mind, always keep track of versions, but don't do that like this, like final, final, 
uh, and uh, all this stuff. You should always know which model you're actually going to deploy. And I would personally recommend to save the model at each of the iterations, if you can, so you could uh, roll back and reproduce some of the experiments you had. And uh, not only the versions of model are important, uh, but also the pipelines, the code you use for that, and the data sets too. And you can use, for instance, Git and DVC if you want to track changes in your data sets. Uh, DVC actually helps with tracking changes in model versions in, and in data sets. And Git is obviously for Python scripts. Also, there is MLflow, which is open source as well. And uh, MLflow uh, actually helps you to track uh, versions of models. So when you can even use it for hyperparameters tuning. For instance, you have some scripts for tuning your models. You can run them with MLflow. And as a result, you have uh, several versions of your models. You see uh, the date when you train them, the version of the model, and you can even use some uh, and uh, set some uh, tar target metrics like uh, mean absolute error accuracy or whatever you want. And in such a way, you just sort uh, your model versions and you see the best one in terms of the performance. So it's quite convenient if you want to like, choose the best model uh, because of some, having some uh, values of metrics. So you can use MLflow for that. Also, there is Pachyderm, uh, which is good for uh, tracking uh, versions of uh, pipelines. So uh, it tracks changes in data sets and in Python scripts, which actually cause these changes. But for Pachyderm, you have to have some uh, engineering background. So uh, if uh, you have some basic knowledge of Docker and Kubernetes and you're convenient with that, you can actually use Pachyderm. But I personally used custom solution. I tried all of them. Why I used custom solution? Because uh, I developed my models in Jupyter Notebooks, and it's hard to uh, tr track versions of Jupyter Notebooks in Git. It's not that convenient. And uh, in such a way, I just had a module which helped me to save uh, the name of the model, what has changed, the date when it was trained, and then fetch like, the, uh, the latest versions which uh, I saved, which was pretty convenient. Also, document everything. I know documentation is boring and like no one does it, but uh, we do a lot of experiments and even some small things like inputting the missing values with uh, different uh, values, not like you did in the, some of the previous experiments, can cause changes in the results you get in your models. So I would recommend at least have some short description of the features you had in the model, of the basic description of the architecture of your model, and maybe some explanation of what data sets you use for that. Also, if you want to avoid writing documentation, you can try to keep your Jupyter Notebooks clean. I know it's hard, but you can try to uh, use the headlines, the markdowns. Uh, I think that Jupyter Notebooks are quite good for reporting. Uh, so, so you can just run several experiments and write down that I use this or that results or something like that was not really good in terms of performance for the final version, so I didn't use it. Also, keep uh, all the changes in code. It may sound obvious, but sometimes we just don't notice when we rename some files, when we send some data sets over messengers to our colleagues or something like that. So the more manual stuff you have in your uh, pipeline, the harder it gets to reproduce it, actually. And um, as a result, what actually deployment-oriented mindset gives you? You already know about some situations which can happen if you don't prepare. So you uh, already know some risks you can avoid. So you have less risks in the late phases when you already cannot change something and you're limited to the deadlines. And as a result, there are less postponed deadlines. Also, it gets easier to estimate tasks. In data science, probably it's not that important to make estimates, but in my work, I had to provide estimates. Uh, so, um, I, when I knew about some of the risks, which I avoided already because you, I prepared for that at each of the stages, I already know that this task will, be, will roughly have that estimate. I can even estimate the phases of the model process and the process uh, of the development, uh, the whole process of it. So, it's quite convenient. 
and you get to understand better the responsibilities distribution in your team. Uh, when you start involving people like data engineers, developers, those who change uh, the way how your data is stored, the format of it, and who can make decisions about changing that, you already know uh, whom you can involve in the future. And I would also recommend not only try to involve people during the development phase, but also you can do some tech talks if your company uh, is okay with that and it uh, suits the culture of your company. Uh, so uh, you could describe to other people how they influence your work and how you influence their work. So uh, thank you for your attention. Happy data sciencing. And uh, you can write to me on LinkedIn, Twitter, follow me on GitHub. Uh, and also I'm writing a series of articles to continue the theme about deployment. Uh, so uh, you can follow my blog on Medium for that. Okay, Questions? let's thank Mariana for an interesting... <laughs> okay, so we do have some questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, what do you think about cloud, uh, cloud machine learning solutions such as Azure and uh, AWS SageMaker, which partially or fully automate process of deployment? Well, I heard of them and I actually tried the SageMaker. It's quite good if you can allow your, if your company actually allows uh, to use those solutions because sometimes you have to only focus on something completely open source. But uh, I think it's uh, quite cool that you can deploy uh, the model right from the Jupyter notebooks, like you can do that with SageMaker. But um, I personally like more when you can do this in form of a service because uh, sometimes uh, data scientists, they don't really pay attention too much to the quality of code and to the testing as well. So uh, when you just do this in Jupyter notebooks, it's hard to like, keep them clean and uh, test all of this kind, all this kind of stuff. But these are good solutions if you actually can use them. Okay, thank you. What if you have several number of clients and each client should have each own customized model? How it can be efficiently deployed? Uh, can, can you repeat? The... Yeah. Um, so if you have several number of clients and each client uh, has its own customized model, mm -hmm. uh, how it can be efficiently deployed? Well, you can have several automated pipelines. I personally really like to automate a lot of things. So uh, you can have um, some pipelines which you can reuse for that. And uh, when you uh, already have some different model, you can just analyze the way how, uh, how it differs from the previous solutions you had. And you can always like, improve your own uh, automated pipeline for that. So um, usually for me, it wouldn't be any problem to deploy a new model if I already built a deployment service, I can just reuse it and improve it uh, as the time goes and I test it more and more. Okay, thank you. How machine learning models are integrated in CI, CD processes of product development? Uh, of development? Uh, of in product, my? product development in uh, CI or CD processes? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I would say that uh, it depends on the company, probably, if I understood the question. Well, I think that it depends what you use. It's quite a like, broad question. Uh, you can use different tools for CI, CD, uh, but how they're integrated, I would say that if you have only data scientists in your team, Sometimes it gets uh, hard to uh, do this kind of stuff, like build uh, a good pipelines for that. You have to like, pay really a lot of attention to that. So probably you should always have some person who actually is focused on that. So it depends from one company to another how well it is implemented in a particular company. Um, like uh, when you can understand that it's good in terms of uh, testing? You mean the features like I described or just the whole process? Well, obviously you can miss some cases, but with time when you deploy different models, you start to pay attention to more and more cases. Like uh, I described that not because I deployed just one model, but because I improved uh, the whole pipeline many times. 
so um, like I cannot say that there is relevantly like one number of uh, coverage by tasks which you can accept. I would say that in software engineering, you can take it from the software engineering if you're just uh, testing your service for deployment. But if you use something like uh, SageMaker uh, or you deploy right from your Jupyter notebooks, it's, it gets harder to test this code and uh, it's harder to say about the test coverage. Well, you can test uh, your model at different uh, stages, like um, in production, when, when it's running in production, you can have logs and you can uh, write down all these different cases and you can go back to them. So uh, before the deployment, uh, I would say that it's just another theme about the evaluation of the model because, again, in different projects in different companies, uh, different things are important for the model evaluation. Like you have different uh, metrics like accuracy, you can have um, business metrics, uh, and uh, sometimes uh, there are some corner cases which you should pay attention to. So it's like really broad theme, I would say, and uh, there, there is a lot of stuff to pay attention to. Oh, can you repeat? Do you do things like that in CI? Well, partly, yeah. Uh, you can uh, write some unit tests for the features, but if you came up with new features like completely, uh, of course you have to write it from the scratch for the new model. Good. Sorry, one extra question. Can be the situation that on... Uh, development stage uh, before uh, deploying on production, uh, your metrics shown good re uh, shows good results, good accuracy, but when you deploy it on production, on real data, they, these metrics are getting worse and shows much worse results than it was on uh, deployment stage when you, you uh, were running these unit tests or acceptance tests. Uh, what, what, you, what should you do in these situations and how can we avoid it? Thank you. When you actually run the test, you can only check uh, your expectation of the model with the data set you have, but obviously you cannot check uh, how your model is going to behave on the real data, usually. So you actually can see it only in production. And obviously it happens that uh, the model gets worse in terms of uh, performance, and uh, sometimes when a few months passes only, but sometimes instantly you see that uh, something went uh, worse. So in such a case, uh, you have to check uh, everything on this data, like maybe your model was uh, overfitted and you have to retrain it, or maybe the data has changed and sometimes it like, takes you too long to develop a model and uh, something changed in customer's behavior and uh, you see that in production uh, those patterns, they do not correspond to the one you actually predicted in your model. So I would say that the only solution is actually retrain it or going through all the process back and building a completely new model for that. But as well, there are, can be such problems like uh, something is wrong, like bugs in the system, something went uh, wrong with the data, or maybe you just chose the wrong like, threshold for uh, making the decision. Again, you have to, it's like the first cases you can, cha you can check, but uh, if you see that uh, like, uh, the data is accurate and everything, like, the whole, everything in the environment is accurate, but something wrong with the model itself, then you can like, it right back to the building the, the new model. Okay, thank you. Um, what is the best way to organize continuous development of models for many clients? And how to build scalable process? Mm, uh, the best way, uh, l like it's hard to say because uh, there is a lot of tools on the market. Again, like uh, Amazon provides, Microsoft, Google has some tools for that. And uh, I would say that it depends on the specialist, but at first I would recommend to hire some data engineers because sometimes companies orient too much on data scientists. They think that uh, we are like unicorns who can do all the math behind 
uh, the making solution that we can uh, also understand the business and build uh, a, something good, like a good uh, solution in terms of uh, software engineering. But I would say that data engineers are necessary for making like a good CI CD pipelines in your company and make it uh, like more automate uh, so you could use it uh, in different cases for different customers. Okay, thank you. And um, why do you use Jupyter, uh, Jupyter Notebook in practice, even though it's not convenient in the deployment? Um, don't you mind it's better switching to PyCharm, VS Code, etc.? Well, I would say that I don't mind, but um, it just historically happened like that, that when I started in data science, actually, actually I was a software engineer, I was a Java developer before uh, I started uh, as a data scientist. But uh, when I just learned things, I used Jupyter Notebooks for that, and uh, probably that's why I'm actually developing models in Jupyter Notebooks. But um, not on, it's, there is not only the historical reason, like uh, I think that Jupyter Notebooks are good for experiments, because for me it's complicated to see, when I have to like, see the instantly the result of some operation, it's not that convenient uh, to go into the debugging mode and all this kind of stuff. But uh, I feel convenient with using PyCharm, for instance, because I used it for deploying models. So, like, I don't mind, but for me, it's convenient to use Jupyter Notebooks for development. Thank you. And uh, sorry, uh, you said you use a plugin for model versioning. Yeah. But uh, you deploy like, or you use that from notebooks, right? You mean when I try different uh, tools? Different, different things. You try different things, produce different models, you save the versions, the model themselves. But uh, can you like reproduce the training or the whole process of past models? Do you version the code that produced that model? Yeah, I um, I would say that if you use Jupyter Notebooks, it's hard with the version, and you can try using Git, but still it's not that convenient to check pull requests, all this kind of stuff. Uh, like, the, the most uh, convenient thing for me was just keeping clean Jupyter Notebooks, just, uh, like, um, committing them to the right branch so I could know that it was the final version which I actually used in production. And I usually uh, use uh, some pipelines for that, like, I have a module, so I can always go back to this code. It's not something I write from scratch every time I develop a new model. So it's like this code, this changes, and uh, it is... A Python scripts, which can actually be checked in, in Git. So, uh, for me, it's like the most convenient uh, way of doing that. Uh, thank you. That sounds interesting. I will follow up later with thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. And uh, how would you recommend to handle trade-off between super cool features and deployment complexity? Between uh, between super cool features and uh -huh. deployment complexity. Oh, it, it's a good question because sometimes uh, you have really good features uh, which can be uh, really influential for the performance and accuracy of your model, and then you just understand that you cannot deploy them. Sometimes it's like really painful to remove those, uh, but if you have time for that, because sometimes you, like the deadlines are quite fixed, if you have a time for that, you can try to deploy those features. So I would say it depends, mostly for me, it depended on the deadlines I had. But I always try to keep uh, the best features and try to deploy them if I could. Great thanks to Mariana. Thank you.